feel very welcome here. My name is Dorota Leśniak Rychlak and I'm greeting you here on behalf of uh, Institute, Goethe Institute Krakow and our organization, which is Institute of Architecture, Institute of Architecture. We are very grateful to the director of Goethe Institute, Charlotte Hermeling, who unfortunately cannot be here because she's ill, for letting us run the cycle and for Dorota Krakowska, who is also co-organizing co the event. And also we are grateful to the National Museum and its director, uh, Andrzej Batley, for hosting us here. Uh, but our most warm welcome goes to Rainier de Graaf, who accepted our invitation and is here to talk to us about uh, architecture without qualities. And it is uh, within the cycle we organize with Goethe Institute called Elements of Architecture, a title borrowed from Rem Koha's uh, exhibition in 2014, Biennale of Architecture. And last year edition, it was about reuse. And this time we're going to talk about blocks of flats as prefabricated housing, but also how it is uh, done today. And let me shortly introduce uh, Rainier de Graaf to you, although I know that probably it's not needed, but uh, how, however I make it short. Uh, so Rainier de Graaf is a Dutch architect, architectural theorist, urbanist and writer, as you can see. Uh, he is a partner, the longest serving non-founding partner of the Office of Metropolitan Architecture, OMI. And he is the author, as you see, the book Four Walls and a Roof, The Complex Nature of a Simple Profession. And he graduated from the Delft University and uh, he did his master's degree in architecture at Berlache Institute and joined OMA after practicing in 1996. Uh, he is responsible for several building and master planning projects in Europe, Russia, and Middle East. Uh, and I'm not going to list the projects as, as I was asked to omit it. Uh, he, is also, uh, he also led the master plan of the Skolkovo Innovation Center, so the so-called Russian Silicon Valley, which is also described, the whole story is described in the book in a very fascinating way and very funny. Uh, uh, he is also involved in the future planning of Amsterdam Airport and the Hamad uh, International Airport in Qatar. Uh, in uh, 2002, the graph uh, has directed the works of Om AMO, which is OMA think tank. Um, he is also an architectural curator um, he curated an exhibition on hold in, at the British School in Rome about the impact of financial crisis on OMA master planning work across the globe. And he also curated the exhibition Public Works, Architecture by Civil Servants, which was featured at the Venice Biennale in 2012 and then uh, re-featured in, in Berlin. Um, he also co-authored and edited three books on behalf of Alma, Content, Almanac, and Almanac Second, Gav Continued. And we are here to talk, uh, perhaps a starting point for, for Rainier's talk, I don't know, but I hope, will be one of the chapters of his book, uh, which is called, entitled, Architecture Without Qualities, and it's about Marzahn in Berlin, so there is also a link to Germany. And now I will stop. And Rainier, please take the floor. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, can we switch off the lights, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> uh, thanks for inviting me. Hi, everybody. Um, the title of this lecture is uh, named after one of the chapters in this uh, book, uh, but it's really the book itself uh, I would like to talk about. The reason why uh, I am here is uh, on the occasion that uh, we have reached 
an agreement for a translation of the book into Polish, uh, at which point it will be called Szteri Siany i Dach. Um, I'm pronouncing it, uh, it well, and that will be the first translation of the book in any foreign language uh, so far. So I'm, 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 I'm very, very um, honored and, and happy about that. I have prepared a short presentation which in a way tries to uh, convert the book into lecture form, and, and given that the book is actually itself the result of many lectures, that is a bit of a regressive uh, effort, I guess, uh, in, in some way. But I've, I've tried my best, and at best this is in a way a sneak preview of the tone and things that, uh, that are in the book. The book consists of seven uh, parts. Uh, each part, uh, in a way, serves to debunk a myth that in my view, that in my view is uh, looming over the profession of, of architecture. In short, the myth of authority. I think that's self-evident. The myth of uh, individual inspiration. The myth of ideology. It's, this promise is a very good landing for the... <laughs> um, the myth of ideology, the myth of professionalism, the myth of independence, the myth of mastery over the large scale, and finally, the myth of progress. And I think, of course, these are in themselves very laudable uh, ambitions. And it is hard to, in a way, fault a profession for trying to live up to these things. But I think there is a particular danger to all of them. Similarly to the seven cardinal virtues uh, in the Bible, it, it only takes a slight shift of temperature for the seven cardinal virtues to turn into seven, sorry, seven cardinal uh, sins. The, in, in my view, uh, exactly such a change uh, of temperature has taken place in the world of architecture with the transition from the 20th to the 21st century, whereby an uncritical continuation of the ethos of architects uh, has become highly problematic. I, I, I will try to explain that. At first sight, uh, one could say that the, uh, that the, our, the life of architecture in the 20th to the 21st century uh, is, is like a reprise of the 20th century. Uh, century, that in a way all the products of the 20th century feature again, can, can this stop? So. Okay. Uh, that all the, uh, in a way, products of the 20th century feature in the 21st century in some way, shape, or form. This is the Wolkenbügel Lichitsky the same Wolkenbügel in Hamburg a century later, the Vesnin brothers in Russia, Safdi in things, the Hotel Forum here with this bit of a stretch of the imagination refeatures as Adit's factory in Wolfsburg. There is the uh, Unité, uh, Unité d'Habitation by Richard Meyer in uh, Marseille. There is Le Corbusier in America. There is Peter Eisenman in Utrecht in the 20th century. There is Rietveld in the 21st century. Um, we all know what this is, uh, uh, essentially, and, and nothing is personal uh, per se. Uh, this is our, our very own bus stop in Groningen with a significant reduction uh, of the wall. Um, I'm trying to say this because, I mean, you could say that in very many ways it's an extra lapse of victory of modern architecture, that in a way uh, all this is very good, that finally the prototypes of modern architecture are completely embedded uh, in, in society, uh, that they're being executed, etc., etc. Nevertheless, I don't think it's as simple as that. This is the prototype, uh, the Maison Domino, the, pro the prototype Le Corbusier launched in 1914, uh, a prototype that triggered uh, a whole series of liberations uh, in architecture, uh, reinforced concrete, columns as a low-bearing structure, free walls, a free facade, and essentially an escalation 
uh, uh, of, of, of uh, liberations in architecture. This is the same prototype physically uh, executed in the 21st uh, century. Uh, only this isn't the prototype executed, this is actually an advertisement from a Greek website that uh, lists the advantages of, uh, of leaving a structure unfinished for the very many tax breaks one could get as a result. So the irony is, weirdly, the prototype has triumphed. The prototype is now the structure of virtually every building that gets built, but its physical triumph weirdly coincides with its ideological uh, bankruptcy. Uh, modern architecture used to be accompanied by all sorts of manifestos, which were very emphatic about its political aims and the cause it uh, stood for. Uh, since the beginning uh, of the 90s, this is the same titles uh, from the previous slide uh, put in the timeline, and curiously you could say that since the beginning of the 90s, that confidence of the profession, that stream of manifestos has dried uh, up. In a way, the prototypes that were launched a century earlier, even if modern architecture continues, have been gradually uh, eliminated and are now discarded as models. I would say since the mid-70s, since the demolition of Pruitt Igo estate in, in America, which was of course, uh, it was even televised, it was much written about by Charles Jenks, uh, it was written about in Collage City, generally heralded as the bankruptcy of modern architecture's ideological claim. Uh, that modern architecture in any social aspect could make a difference from then on was supposedly no longer true. And Pruitt Igo is in a way the first of a long series of demolition that have taken place anywhere in the world, here in uh, Sheffield, uh, Chicago, uh, Dublin, Italy, Paris, uh, Lyon, uh, Nantes, uh, Belfast, Glasgow, uh, again Lyon, uh, uh, Vitry-sur-Seine, uh, Glasgow uh, again, and, and here uh, a building in, in Germany. So uh, pruitt Igo was the, the, the first in a long series where in a way the, the, the real substance of modern architecture in the 20th century slowly becomes uh, undone. So manifestos dried up, uh, manifestos about the city dried up around about the uh, beginning of the 90s. Uh, however, uh, that didn't mean that the city stopped growing. In fact, the worst or most extreme urban explosion in the history of mankind, in the one that took place in Asia, took place exactly uh, in that period that, that manifestos on, uh, on modern architecture manifestos dried up. And there's a weird irony. So this is the discarded model. But it's not discarded everywhere. This same discarded model is actually still the prototype for a large uh, wave of urbanization, probably a bigger wave of urbanization than ever took place in the West. This is a photograph taken in a random Chinese uh, sales uh, office. Uh, essentially, the, 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 the field of Joe's executed as a simple commercial venue for a simple expansion of a simple Chinese town. There you have it. Um, urbanization has a very interesting uh, effect in China. The average urban person contributes about five times as much to the Chinese economy as a rural person. Therefore, you could say, if everybody goes to live in the city, the whole country becomes five times as rich. I mean, that is a simple uh, economic uh, calculus. And, and here, uh, you then see a very different thing, is that urbanization becomes proof of a certain amount of political success. It becomes proof of development, it becomes proof of, of prosperity, to the point that in China, you don't really know whether the, GD, the larger GDP per capita leads to urbanization, or whether it's actually urbanization that leads to a larger GDP. Uh, and, the, and the relation, weirdly, uh, has become kind of reciprocal. Uh, the Chinese town, or the Chinese version of the Ville Radios, has become a global model. This is a town for a million people, built in a space of less than four years. It is not in China, 
It is a Chinese product, project, but it is in Africa. It is a new town, one of the new towns built in Angola uh, under the direction of the MPLA um, uh, as a partnership between uh, China and uh, Angola. As I said, uh, an enormous uh, city, largely uh, owing its existence and its design to kind of modern uh, principle. Uh, the city is built uh, as the result of a massive uh, loan from China to Angola, a loan that is paid for in kind by oil, uh, a loan that is backed by oil uh, flowing from Angola to China. There's one condition to the loan, uh, and the, the condition to the loan is that the, uh, all the money of the loan is spent on Chinese firms building the city. So that means the money is paid in China to Chinese firms. The money doesn't even leave China. Oil flows from Angola to China. And in return, concrete, prefabricated concrete paneling is shipped from Angola to Africa. So it is almost a form of primitive trade for goods for goods, where money doesn't even change, properly change uh, hands anymore. The, the idea for this, very interestingly, uh, was brokered by a French a businessman who had applied a decade before during the civil war in Angola the same principle of trading oil for arms. So essentially the financial infrastructure of trading goods for goods, oil for concrete or oil for arms was in place and was simply transferred from a relation of Angola and France to an Angola but a relation of Angola and, and China. So here you have the, uh, the billboard announcing the city. It was announced uh, with a lot of festivities, with a lot of uh, advertisement. There was a, a promotional film uh, made about it uh, at the start, Sino-Angolan Partnership uh, at Work. This is the Angolan president with the then uh, Chinese prime minister, uh, with personal uh, involvement of the Angolan president. More public space over there, please. Um, a city for the young, a city for the old, uh, a city with all modern convenience, without any barriers for handicapped. In other words, a city built according to all the modern standards that uh, meanwhile prevail uh, globally, and a city with some funny stuff too. Uh, um, but more about that later. Um, so that happened. That was essentially a modern city built in the middle of Africa, uh, paid for by oil. There was a general uh, assumption that oil money would create a middle class uh, in Angola and that therefore there would be a prospective audience for this city. However, uh, in 2012, by the time the city was finished, the price of oil plummeted uh, globally, so the prospective middle class didn't come. The apartments were priced between $120,000 and $200,000, while the average Angolan still had to live on less than $2 uh, a day. The city remained empty. A city of, of a million homes, uh, a, a complete enormous uh, city, larger than Krakow, larger than uh, Amsterdam, remained completely empty, which was, of course, the Western media and later Al Jazeera jumped on it to broadcast this scandal uh, to the world, of course, sensationalizing it, of course, very happy that it was a Chinese fuck-up and not a Western uh, fuck-up, and they were very quickly there to uh, broadcast the news. Apparently, the school children that had emerged in the promotional film were hired uh, actors, and, and footage of a city with empty lots of buildings, empty parking lots, empty roads, pristine uh, white buildings where the shutters remained closed because nobody lived there, went across the entire uh, world. What ensued uh, was still an empty city, uh, but a very surreal spectacle where, in a way, the same shanty towns of the people who live on $2 a day started to emerge around the city, the same shanty towns that the modern uh, city was meant to replace. It actually didn't replace them, and they simply emerged like a kind of fungus around these new towns. Uh, people tried to squat, but there were very efficient Israeli security firms preventing uh, people from squatting. So behind it, you have the city for a million, and around it, you have about a million people living in, uh, in the same slums. This is very uh, particular, but in a curious way, 
very symptomatic for a place like Angola <coughs> as a whole. Angola has oil. Therefore, one could say that as an African country, Angola is ever, uh, uh, averagely wealthy. Uh, th those riches do not get divided in any meaningful way, so therefore a relatively rich country has no, virtually no rich people. The center of, of its capital, uh, Luanda, is a very prosperous downtown with uh, very uh, escalating real estate prices and a vast majority of musecas or favelas uh, around it, but the city in a way embodies the weird contrast of a rich country with a poor population. The weird paradox is Angola, this is a statistic of GDP per capita, features amongst the poorest nation on earth, but on the Mercer list of wealthy capitals of cost of living, Luanda, its capital, is the most expensive city in the world, at which point any meaningful economical or logical explanation simply see, uh, fails to apply. A modern city supposed to help the average uh, population remains empty and nothing uh, makes uh, sense anymore. And I'm showing this sort of uh, example uh, of Chinese-African partnership not necessarily as an anomaly, not necessarily as something exotic uh, and remote. I'm showing it because exactly that type of project is far less remote from ourselves than we might think. These kind of phantom towns, towns that were empty, not because they're abandoned, but because they were simply never inhabited, are no longer a Chinese or an African phenomenon. They are, since 2008, they are a global phenomenon. Uh, at Harvard, we did research uh, about these type of towns, and we found really hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of towns of them all across the world, uh, suffering from a similar kind of breakdown of economic logic. Uh, this is Spain, uh, a big billboard uh, of a new town uh, on the outskirts uh, of Madrid, Residencial Francisco Hernando, big town of parameter blocks, uh, completely uh, empty. There's another one south of Madrid, uh, built along a stop of the high-speed rail, Ciudad de Valdeluz, kind of half finished, all the infrastructure finished, largely empty, surreal spectacle of empty roads, very young trees, and where actually the sign announcing the city is the biggest architectural masterpiece uh, in the city. Um, this is uh, an empty new town on the outskirts of uh, Turin, Italy. This is a new town, uh, Kashkergen in Ireland, uh, a nice, very nice, pristine suburb that is also completely empty. Uh, this is existing all over. This is in Belgium uh, along the coast. And the weird thing is that, in part and parcel, these are economic failures, but not all of them. There are also examples of huge new developments which have remained completely empty and nevertheless are an economic success. I'd like to use this one as an example. This is a new building uh, of luxury condominiums by Herzog and Demeron in uh, Beirut. And very ironically, uh, to the right of the image is the empty Holiday Inn Hotel, built in the 1970s. To the right is the also empty condominium complex of Herzog and Demeron. Now, both are the same size. The hotel was never inhabited. It was only inhabited by snipers during the Civil War. Towers are very popular uh, for that purpose, too. Ever since then, it has remained empty. It stands there in the middle of the city. There have been numerous redevelopment plans. None of them have uh, worked. It still stands empty as a carcass, as a kind of huge monument to the trauma that Lebanon uh, suffered. The building to the left is not a trauma, it is also empty, but it represents an enormous economical triumph. Its apartments have been sold at record prices to investors, uh, but the building has remained uh, empty. And it's, it's very curious for me. Uh, this is two types of modern architecture. They are both of white concrete, they both have 90 degree angles, they both have a fair amount of glass, they both have a similar technology. Yes, there's a century, half a century between them, but you could see this 
as you know, two genes of the same uh, pool. The Herzog and Demeron building has encountered also a very schizophrenic reaction. The property press, the press of developers, real estate agents, talks about a world-class icon in one of the Middle East's most vibrant cities, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the usual cliche, triumphant cliches are applied. But in the local press, uh, in the local daily uh, press, it is, uh, the building is largely treated as an affront, a building that simply helps to push prices up in the middle of Beirut and will make the center even more unaffordable to the average Lebanese or Beiruti inhabitant. And here you have precisely uh, the schism I spoke about from the 20th to the 21st century. Modern architecture, while using the same language of economic production, rational production, abstraction, quick constructions, etc., etc., contributes to a very, very different aim than, let's say, the architecture which was accompanied by manifestos was originally intended for. It operates uh, according to a very, very fundamental logic, a logic which you can only be explained, not ever in architectural terms, but only by, in a way, analyzing the economic system that underlies it and the role that property or buildings have come to play in that economic uh, system. I'd like to make a little excursion to uh, an analysis I made of the book of Thomas Piketty. It's also an essay uh, in, the, in, in the book. Thomas Piketty is a French economist, and he has conducted a very long research on inequality and the real economic reasons for inequality. What he has compared since the beginning of time is the return on labor vis-a-vis -vis the return on capital. In, other, in very simple words, how much money is made from working, how much money is made from having money. And he argues that as soon as you make more money from having money, somebody else who works can work all they want, but they never catch up. The divide grows. So he's made an analysis over the two, over the course of history, since the beginning of, uh, of times, where in a way the top line with the black dots is the return on capital, the one with the white dots is the return uh, on labor. And interestingly, when you zoom in, <coughs> um, one would think that one would always make more money from working, but you see that historically uh, it is actually a very, very short uh, period, uh, a very, very short period where actually the returns on labor, making money from working, surpassed making money from, making, from having money. That is also, very curiously, the period of the modern project. If you look at all these manifestos, at all these utopias, at all these visions for the future city, and you put them in a timeline, they sort of neatly uh, coincide uh, with exactly the period that you could emancipate yourself through labor. And it's very eerie, once you compare the history of architecture to the history of the economy, very scary parallels emerge. You see the two dots, and you see the moment that they start creeping towards each other uh, again. That is exactly the moment that pruitt Igo was demolished in the 1970s. A very big moment uh, in time. Manifestos on architecture still get produced, but they have a more pensive tone, they have a less confident tone, they become case studies. Uh, delirious New York, learning from uh, Las Vegas. They become more historically uh, aware, and in a way they complete the remaining line. But if you zoom out, and that is the interesting thing, you see that the period during which at least my generation was mostly educated, the period we hold to be true, the period we think is the outcome of a long evolution, is, is finally the things being the way they ought to be, is actually a brief exception uh, in, in history. A weird exception that lasts more or less from 1914 till 19, the beginning of the 90s. From actually the outbreak of World War I, the major breakdown of aristocracy, to the fall of the Berlin uh, Wall. Those are major historic events. Now let's look at the major architectural manifestos from those same years. The most important manifesto of 1914 <coughs> was the Futurist Manifesto by Philippe Tommaso Marinetti, published in Le Figaro, very optimistic about what technology 
would bring, talking of a time <coughs> of major upheaval, major modernization, and major change. The most important manifesto, or at least the most sold architecture book of 1989, was a vision of Britain by Prince Charles. And this is very curious that, in a way, an age that starts with the end and the overthrow of aristocracy would culminate in a manifesto written by a British aristocrat. Both men <coughs> are fanatic fans of hunting, to the point that one could even have a case of mistaken uh, identity. Uh, both men are also passionate lovers, or were passionate lovers, of architecture, as is evidence here, a seamless continuation from the Belvedere in Vienna to Buckingham uh, Palace. And if you look at it this way, the brief period Piketty describes in his book, where you know uh, a period of economic emancipation of those who worked, if it starts with aristocracy and ends with aristocracy, one could argue that those period may as well never have taken place, that what we are witnessing is nothing strange. What we are witnessing today is simply history resuming its normal course, depressing uh, as it may sound. It's property that makes money, and it's property that makes increasingly more money than uh, labor uh, does. And curiously, real estate, property, buildings, in other words, play a crucial role inside uh, this system. Buildings are the largest asset category uh, in the economic systems today, particularly residential building. The combined value of real estate is, a, is about three times uh, the size of global GDP. This is asset, this is labor. So very curiously, uh, the line of capital is overtaking the line of labor, effectively means the line of property and, and the accruance of value of property overtaking the line of labor. Again, miraculously coincided almost with the end of the manifesto in architecture. After that, buildings simply play a very, very different role. Uh, you see it everywhere. Uh, in all major capitals, houses are bought by investors. There is no demographic need underlying the record prices. There's no scarcity. There's no homelessness. There is no escalating British, Dutch, or German population. The population has been stable for decades. So it's not scarcity that drives this. Architecture is produced today not because people are looking for a home, but because money is looking for a home. With an all-time low of interest rates globally, it's better to have your money anywhere than have your money in the bank. And where better to have it than in buildings? So there we go. 70% of the new houses in London were bought by foreign investors. 30% uh, of condos in Manhattan, foreign investors, Vienna, 10% of houses mostly from Russia and the Ukraine, same story. One third of Vancouver's real estate owned by Chinese buyers, foreign investors again. Uh, over 100,000 Chinese millionaires have moved into Vancouver. None of them are actually living there, uh, perhaps with the exception of the Chinese girlfriend of the mayor uh, of Vancouver. Melbourne. Uh, uh, again, uh, for, uh, for a vast uh, amount of money sold to Australian city. Then I even came across a story of Warsaw as the hidden investment hotspots for Brits and other investors looking for value in Europe post-Brexit. So uh, objects in your rearview mirror are closer uh, than they appear. And whenever something like this happens, invariably, Liebeskind is at the center. I don't know why uh, that is, but we, we are finding this to be a bit of a consistent uh, pattern. Uh, this is his Slota 44 in Moscow, uh, a, a major inhabitant, Lewandowski, who presumably will, I'm assuming he will spend most of his time in Munich and not in his Warsaw apartment. Um, but the absent owner, the absent uh, celebrity owner is another key feature in today's real estate. This is a Chinese uh, world famous chef who paid 16.2 million for a penthouse in Amsterdam. Uh, this is property tycoon Nick Candy buying a penthouse in One Hyde Park for 160 million, which he actually curiously bought from himself to simply up uh, the value. Uh, Michael Dell, CEO of Dell Technologies, a uh, 100 million apartment in New York, most expensive residential deal until then. Uh, of uh, factory director, Bernard Lowe, a penthouse, 45 million. 
uh, Qatari Naval, 60.2 million for another one, Semina Vignoli Tower, another uh, Saudi retail magnet, and prices escalate ever further until you reach kind of Jennifer Lopez, who probably never even bought the apartment, but simply agreed to have her name used in a sales uh, brochure. I'm wondering all the time, <clears throat> you know, uh, ever more residential property is built for people who will never live there. Ever more residential property is built for money that is looking for a home, not people that is looking for a home. Is there an effect on architecture? Could one say that? Towers get slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. And of course, when you only have one apartment per floor, the fact that your neighbor is absent, you don't notice it because he lives on another floor. So you're only confronted with your own absence. Your whole apartment is like a vitrine, like a window showcase of wealth rather than anything else. So this is a little speculative uh, uh, extrapolation. So this is uh, the Park Avenue Tower by Vignoli, the building by Shop, which is even slimmer. Uh, and when nobody lives there, do you really, can you really talk about a building or are you talking about a piece of sculpture? This is Ellsworth Kelly. Brancusi, and could we imagine a situation where we built life-size Brancusis in the middle uh, of Manhattan that's in solid gold that simply could then serve as an alternative investment? And this may sound very far-fetched and very weird, but there is already a generation of buildings emerging where the use is not the primary raison d'etre of the building, but the use is kind of a convenient alibi to build. Uh, this is the monument of the constitution. This is in Turkmenistan, where they probably have a monument and no constitution. <laughs> uh, same city, the, uh, this is the house of the world's largest Ferris wheel. This is the palace of happiness, uh, it is called. Uh, and this is the house of free creativity in the shape of a book. Uh, and the House of Free Creativity exists alongside a golden statue of the dictator. Um, this is the city of Ashgabat, the newly found capital in Turkmenistan, a city even far larger than the city I showed uh, in Africa, a, a monument, a, a, actually not a building as a piece of sculpture, but an entire capital as a symbol of sculpture, as a symbol of an investment of an entire nation. Uh, which stands also completely empty, which has a transport system to, in a way, transport no one from nowhere to nowhere, but it's fully there and up and running. It has a computerized driver, so even the driver is absent. It's a self-perpetuating computerized machine that makes money and accrues value, but nobody lives there. It is a totally surreal spectacle. And that is Ashgabat in Turkmenistan. Again, a somewhat remote, quaint, and exotic location, I guess, to most of us. But the weird thing is that this last picture of these white buildings is not Ashgabat. This is actually Vancouver. And that trumps a very, very strange uh, irony. Is that Vancouver, you know, most notoriously, always very high on the rank of the most livable cities, along with Melbourne and, and Vienna. Uh, we did some research, and we looked at the top 10 cities with most vacant real estate in the world. And it's almost exactly the same list. So in other words, cities are livable when you don't live there. Uh, which I guess is, is supreme proof of the point I'm trying to make. So another thing we uh, studied uh, was actually uh, the income development in those same places. Uh, this is uh, from the 1950s on. This is an average of the incomes in those 10 cities. We see income generally rise, rise with pay rises, general economic growth, inflation correction, etc., etc., etc. This is the red line is the mortgages banks are willing to provide to people on the basis of that income. I mean, uh, for a while it's four or five times your income that you can lend from the bank pay it off over 25 years and you can live in a place. Since 2008, you see a slight dip, the banks are a bit cautious, then there's economic recovery, the line goes up again, but it's between four and five times of your income that you can lend and pay off. Um, this is the way housing prices have developed in those cities, which also curiously shows that 
Those prices also began to escalate uh, after the fall of the wall, also in the period of Piketty, uh, where the return of capital overtook the return of labor. And at a certain moment, it's simply impossible for anybody with a regular income to buy any property. Uh, it definitively eclipses the realm of the vast majority of people, and it's already happening uh, in those cities. So you wonder uh, what is to be done Burning Questions of Our Movement, a book uh, <laughs> written by Lenin at the beginning of the century. Does the property uh, development warrant uh, another revolution? Because, I mean, housing is a primary need of people. One could imagine with, with when the trend goes on that essentially um, that the more uh, the 21st century begins to look like the 19th century, that the more or less the outcome of the 19th century, which I guess was the Ruff Russian Revolution, becomes, uh, becomes likely again. Revolution attacks capital. By far the largest source of capital is residential real estate uh, at the moment. So it is not unthinkable that in a way, if real estate can topple an economic crisis, it could also spark a kind of global form of resistance uh, at some point. <coughs> Sorry. I'd like to give a little uh, example, uh, and, and the point of the example is to show that actually for once architects are probably in the same boat and on the same side uh, as people. This building, well you know what this is, this is the Gherkin in the city of uh, London. This was a building that since its completion has changed hands twice, it's been sold twice. In the course of those two sales, uh, it went from costing 350 million pounds to being worth a billion pound at the last sale. So in the course of 15 years, the building tripled in value. This is what it cost to build the building. Uh, then underneath is how much of that is construction cost. Uh, this Foster was the architect. I'm assuming Foster is very good at organizing a good fee. So we're assuming 5% of construction cost. So let's say Foster's fee was probably 7 million. I mean, I don't know, but I guess it's in the realm of uh, the normal. Then you look at the increase in value of the building itself, which is 720 million pounds, which is more than 100 times the architect's fee in, in the course of the years after he completes his uh, labor. And I thought this was a very interesting quote uh, also from the 19th century, which strangely applies to the situation of Foster. It is only after men have raised themselves above the rank of animals, when therefore their labor has been to some extent socialized, that a state of things arises in which the surplus labor of the one becomes a condition of the existence of uh, the other. Strangely, uh, weirdly apt. Um, architecture or revolution, that is uh, a quote from Le Corbusier, and I think it's a very weirdly ironic quote, because I think in this day, probably more than uh, ever, it, this is a choice. As an architect, mostly you are complicit in processes like this, and even if you, I, as a child, I always wanted to be two things, an architect and a revolutionary, and unfortunately, uh, by the age of 30, I had to make a definitive choice. Um, <laughs> the thing is, I find it very interesting to think what kind of role could architecture play? What kind of subversive role could architecture play in the context of this system? So we did a little thinking. This is the ethos of architecture uh, as it was devised by Vitruvius uh, about 2,000 years ago. Uh, that ethos is based on durability, use and beauty. And you could say that architecture, of course, over the course of the centuries, has undergone multiple stylistic changes, but essentially this ethos hasn't changed. Uh, this is Alberti during the Renaissance, who also talks about architecture as being eternal. Uh, this is Ruskin, who talks about architecture surviving multiple generations in the 19th century. And even a contemporary figure like Frank Gehry hails timelessness as the most important feature to architecture. But I wonder, how appropriate is that ideology still? I mean, let's have a look. Uh, in the Middle Ages, beginning of the Renaissance, the life of a building was about 300 years. Uh, 
then in the 19th century, it went back to about 100 years, uh, 20th century to 50 years, uh, even shorter at some point in our own recent building in The Hague didn't even survive the 25 years. And one could imagine that there come a time when time will actually overtake the life of a building so that we will have buildings with a negative lifespan. In other words, that what you plan of a building is not its construction, but its demolition. That the prime architectural element is not the creation of a building, but the planning of its disappearance. So if you project that on the, on the Latin terms of Vitruvius, you end up with uh, these terms. Buildings should be temporary, buildings should be flexible, and buildings should be uh, humble uh, in terms of anything. In other words, this ethos should be replaced by this ethos. Um, a building should be able, a building should have no loyalty to place. A building should be used for the things primarily for which it was not intended. And a building should be taken away very, very, very quickly. That is the essence. Uh, and weirdly, <clears throat> that kind of uh, casts a very interesting light on a type of architecture that has been discarded ever since the fall of communism. This is Marzahn, uh, a Plattenbau uh, Siedlung on the outskirts of Berlin, uh, much of which has been or is being demolished. It's prefabricated concrete panel housing, and the interesting thing of demolishing prefabricated housing is that it's essentially playing the film of its construction but playing it backward in reverse and you more or less have a recipe for its disappearance. Which means that you end up with the same <coughs> ingredients that went into the building. You can take these, assemble these, transport these, <coughs> reapply these, and even reapply them for a very different uh, type of architecture. This is of course the cover uh, of the book. But that ephemerality doesn't need to stop uh, at this house. I mean, the smaller a building, the easier you could move uh, a building. In fact, you could start moving entire churches. Uh, once you start moving things anyway, does there really need to be a distinction between the vehicle of transport and the actual real estate? In fact, could the vehicle and the real estate be one and the same thing? A house as a truck, a house as a ship, a house that could actually walk, and maybe even a revitalization of Ron Haran's Walking Cities, a utopia from the 1960s, where entire cities simply moved. I, am uh, of course, presented this as a somewhat ham-handed, funny uh, interlude, but I think there is something to this. Because the, the term real estate, and you can do it in Dutch, and I believe I've been told you can do it in Polish too, the term real estate is about that which doesn't move. In other words, the term real estate is the ultimate triumph of a Vitruvian ideology. So therefore, if you have nu rushu uh, <coughs> we could have, as architects, a new category, which would be rushu moshi, <laughs> things which only move, which would mean that the cruel graph uh, of the accumulation of value of the gherkin could be simply mirrored that essentially buildings could depreciate in value like computers, cars, uh, and anything, that there could be true innovation in, in architecture, shorter lease uh, cycles, and most of all, that a particular class of people who make money from our labor could disappear along with it. And that is my propositional extension uh, to uh, the book. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
housing actually didn't notice that they were uh, questioning their own position or, or their own authority because they were not needed anymore. Uh, and perhaps, uh, this is, could you elaborate on this? And perhaps this is also the case now. Yeah, uh, well, the, the interesting thing is that, um, that this is, I, I'm assuming, <coughs> This is the, the essay about German uh, prefabricated buildings you're talking about. There is a quote um, from Mies van der Rohe where he says, in the near future, uh, we will be in the fortunate position that the industry will very easily solve all our uh, artistic dilemmas. And, and that was a very provocative statement that he made it. And as long as it wasn't the case, that statement only sort of elevated the artistic state of the Bauhaus. It elevated the Bauhaus to a status of avant-garde. Um, <clears throat> but of course, weirdly, if that prediction comes true, also Mies gets a little more than he bargained for. It's like the deus ex machina in a theater in reverse. Um, <clears throat> and it's very weirdly, uh, in doing the research for that essay, is that, you know, the Bauhaus was closed by the Nazis. Some architects went to the United States. They became very famous. Uh, other, a, a significant portion of, of them actually emigrated to Russia as the promised land of the time, the, the socialist promised land of the time. And they <clears throat> became primary figures first in Khrushchev's uh, panel housing program, but a lot of them actually re-emigrated to East Germany after the war to, in a way, execute the last chapter of Bauhaus ideology, which meant that the industry made not only the artist, redundant, but it also made the architect uh, redundant. So we, don't, we hardly know their names. I really had to research to dig up some of them. Uh, and we know their buildings, not by name, but we know them because of systems which were called WBS70. I mean, like the, the anonymous license plates of cars was the, the legacy uh, of that. So that, that was for me. And I, I wonder to, to what extent uh, Modernization is about the new and about the old. It's very often about the new, making also part of the old redundant. So it could also very well be that the ultimate modernization, <coughs> in part and parcels, makes the architect redundant, even though the architect loves to talk about modernization. It's like a, a curious death wish, uh, and that was embedded there, and that just fascinated me. By the way, the, the, the thing about the, the dem demolition of buildings and the the Ruchu Mochi and all that stuff is not in the book. Uh, I, I wrote the book as a kind of neutral uh, observant to a lot of trends that struck me. But ever since writing the book, everybody always asks me, do you have a proposition? Do you have a proposition? Do you have a proposition? And I always said no, but I finally gave in. So the latter half of the lecture is a result of my capitulation to do something so propositional. The revolution of well, what is calling for? I think the revolution is, is maybe not even in the proposition itself, because I'm sure it's at least partly highly unfeasible. Uh, but I think the revolution is in the fact that architects think about these things. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I look at the uh, Herzog and Demeron building in Beirut, and I'm, I know them, and I'm pretty sure that they don't think about that. Mm -hmm that they don't think about the effect of their building on Beirut, that they don't think about the fact that their apartments are empty, that the only thing they care about is the pristine detailing of the beautiful abstract balcony fences, concrete, not, the whiteness of the concrete, but I mean about the, the role of the building in the overall uh, sociological system of the building doesn't register. It doesn't register with most architects because it takes such a massive effort to do a decent building that there is very generally very little room to think about those things, even though they're very important. Thank you, Marianne. This was very fascinating. And um, you uh, started the, the, the dog with, with uh, also with this uh, photos of demolition. And uh, you wrote uh, also uh, in a book about this a process of uh, normalization uh, in the, the former DDR that is uh, very often connected with uh, 
demolition of some parts of the housing estates. And what strikes me, uh, because this, this photo essay is also, uh, this photo essay in memorial, in memorial is, also, uh, is also part of the book, and what strikes me is that uh, there, there are no uh, housing estates uh, from this part of the world, uh, from the former Eastern Bloc, apart from DDR. So uh, I wonder what is your perspective, uh, whether this, how this narration applies to this part of the world, and maybe we are just lucky because it is still pretty normal to live in such yeah, I, I, here. <clears throat> I, I I realize that, and uh, but I think to be honest, it's 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 mostly the result of a time lag. Uh, okay. That, that I, I suspect that the process which has started in the West, unless something very drastically changes in the short term, uh, that the process that started in the West a while ago will hit the East in a while. And uh, it's very interesting that, for instance, recently in Moscow, uh, a, a very big demolition uh, or, or modernization or redevelopment program has been launched at, at a lot of the areas with the Khrushchevskis. Mm -hmm. which are also closely coming to their life, their end of their technical uh, lifespan. So I'm sure, it'll, uh, I'm sure it'll happen. It's just that at the timing, uh, at, at, at the timing we closed the book, that program wasn't on the cards and, and simply an image search of all of this stuff uh, generated what it generated. And I think the only, if I remember cor correctly, the only uh, Eastern example is Marzahn, which is Germany, but former East Germany. Mm -hmm. So that's the only. The rest is uh, is a lot in France, uh, a lot in uh, England mm -hmm. and Dublin. But of course, it's a selection of a far larger uh, quantity. Mm -hmm. But I think even if you expand the selection, you will find a similar asymmetry. I suspect. sort of the things I showed in the beginning. I, I think they, uh, they tell themselves that they have a huge amount of authority. Uh, they like to think of themselves as artists. Uh, they like to think of themselves as completely independent from uh, the banal forces that shape everybody's uh, uh, life. And they have an almost unwithering faith in their own abilities despite the odds. But the major shift, actually the major shift of the book uh, I think is, and, and you see that in the type of books that generally get produced by architects or in the architectural world, they're always books about works of architecture, and how great they are and what achievements uh, they are. There are almost no book that talks about the work of an architect. What do you do from day to day? What are the banal struggles that are involved in even getting the most basic buildings built? How are you the result of a force field at play, how are you being manipulated? How, and, and I know for a, very fa for, for a fact, and I think that's partly accounting for the success of the book, is that many of these stories will sound familiar to very, very many architects, but nobody talked about it. And, and I thought it was interesting to, in a way, yeah, talk about it. This is a fascinating read. Perhaps now somebody from the audience will like to. Uh, command 
There's a very a strange schizophrenic attitude uh, about it. I think that the vast amount of architects uh, in schools and in academia uh, still talk about those manifestos, uh, still talk about Le Corbusier, when actually nobody really believes in his doctrines uh, anymore. And I think that that goes for a lot of, uh, of these things. So then what remains is a kind of an almost, I'm, I'm often struck by the blatant cynicism vis-a-vis -vis the underlying message of those books and the stylistic celebration of the type of architecture, which then almost becomes a similar nostalgic reflex as other people's have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, different times. I mean, what's, what I like about the manifestos is their blatant absence of nostalgia. Uh, and I think much of today's interest for modern architecture, for brutalism, for Le Corbusier, is actually a product of nostalgia. But I am, I, I can speak for myself as in a way that I'm very nostalgic for times that were less nostalgic. A critical reading of James J. No, I, I don't think. I, mean, I don't know. Is, is it the Dark Age Ahead? Uh, it's one of the third chapters. All right. Okay. Uh, I, I don't it's think that's. Yeah. I. I don't think that's a manifesto. I, I, I have never thought of Jane Jacobs actually as a manifesto. Uh, I, I think Jane Jacobs is is. It's, it's a very curious figure, and I, I, there is a chapter on public space uh, in my book, which which tries to delineate it. It's uh, Jane Jacobs is a critic of the modern movement and tries to critic the excess of the modern movement. And in the wake of that, she invents a lot of terms and attributes an almost sentimental value to those terms, and thereby obfuscates the terms as well. Uh, I, I think, for instance, the there's, there's a weird irony that everybody talks about public space, but I think the real problems of public space started, the mo started at the moment we started talking about it. Uh, because public space is, in essence, a legal construct. It is space that belongs to the public, which is in any, any way, shape, or form fixed by the law. But then, uh, particularly through her writing, you get kind of prescriptions of what a good public space is. So then you get descriptions of the architecture, you get descriptions of the, of the atmosphere, but that is fundamentally talking about something else than about public uh, space. I have enormous problems with Jane Jacobs. I don't think it qualifies as a manifesto, and it's not linked to the manifesto. I have enormous problems with Richard Sennett, similarly, uh, who, of course, takes an enormous amount of cues of Jane Jacobs, because I think they don't help. Thank you. 
think I get where you're going. Um, <laughs> Uh, a, a few corrections, and I'm not necessarily uh, disqualifying your questions. We are not powerful. We are prominent, but we are not powerful. I mean, I experience our lack of power in my job on a daily basis. Uh, we also didn't make millions, at least I didn't make millions. Uh, it would be nice if I did, but I, I recognize what you say. But I also recognize that a lot of the examples uh, the whole key difference, I think, between our office uh, and uh, a lot of other architectural office is, is an interplay with the context of the time of any given uh, moment. So uh, some of the examples, that was then, now is now. I get accused very often, I mean, I hear this all the time, that, that uh, you don't practice what you preach. But that's completely besides the point. I don't preach what I practice. That is the point. Or I preach precisely because I practice. Uh, that there is now, and I think any architect should do that. As an architect, by definition, you have a very different relation to almost anything than a journalist, uh, an artist, or anything. That you're always stuck and trapped in a very complicated web of dependency. and. You cannot renounce that web, because otherwise you simply have to change, there's, yeah, there's a choice, you can change job, or you can actually exist in that web and work with the knowledge that you acquire as a result of that web. We are acutely, I mean, the empty properties, uh, I, 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 for instance, show, and I show the Hertz and Emerald thing. We get, I'm sure we get asked similar things. I'm sure we run a huge risk of being, uh, complicit in very, very similar things. I can only say that we try to judge those things when we come in and we try not to be complicit when it happens. Doesn't mean it won't ever happen, but there is an enormous uh, awareness of what goes on and also an adjustment of strategy what goes on. I also speak partly for myself. Uh, and of course, at the same time, I'm a member of this office, and the book sort of creates a, a kind of quite a convenient confusion uh, uh, at the time. But I, I think that to some extent, you know, the solution of any problem begins with the frank acknowledgement that there is a problem, even if you yourself are in it. And when I criticize architecture and the role of architecture, I would happily criticize our own architecture. Two, I would happily take stock uh, of the positions we have taken for the last 30 years and probably frankly admit that the effect of some of those positions have been absolutely catastrophical. But I wrote a book and that's, what, that's essentially what I did. I wrote a book and I spoke frankly about the good and the bad. So I will not defend OMA, I will not apologize for its work either. I think it's, I mean, I don't preach what I practice and that's... Uh, the twist of the take here. No, but I can I can actually elaborate. It's it's very, uh, and and I can actually elaborate with an anecdote from the office. One of the most confusing moments in our office are Monday mornings. That's when we have office meetings. Prominent on the agenda is running projects and even more prom new work. Uh, applications that come in. What should we do? What should we not do? What country is politically sound? What country is not politically sound? In the book, there's a very interesting chapter called Trial and Error. It has a, it's an, uh, uh, it's uh, an accumulation of my diary notes over the course of uh, 10 years. It's in Russia, it's in the Middle East, it's in Britain, and in it's Iraq. And the wonderful insights that you can take from those diary notes is that the situation is equally absurd everywhere, that there is counterproductiveness everywhere, that there are very flawed processes at place anywhere. And I think it's essential to the current world that it's, it's very hard to, with any degree of believability, pinpoint 
good places and bad places. The United States is deeply fucked. It's on its way to be a pseudo-democracy, which is no better uh, than its big competitor to the East. So then the only thing you can then do as an architect is be aggressively independent, also from a political stream. It's one of the things we, we, we try to work in Iran. And then we get a problem with our New York offices because there are sanctions. But do you then reject working in Iran politically, or do you simply not work there because of the sanctions impact you? And then you have your political agenda actually being dictated by somebody else. So what we tend to do is take every request that comes in on its own merits and try to make an educated guess between the request that comes in. Because almost any project, in my experience, any building is a neck and neck race between good intentions and bad ulterior motives. And, and the only thing, and, and that's the best I think anyone can offer, is to make a very careful, educated guess to which side will triumph in the end. And there we will make probably different choices now than we would make 30 years ago. There are probably projects we accepted which we wouldn't accept again. That happens in the life of an architect. But I think the only methodical uh, disposition in response to your question is, is an almost minute labor where you, where you look at things individually. You look at the effort individually, and that essentially means that in, in, in terms of assessing new work for the office, it, it becomes a humongous task, because it becomes more work than actually less work, because you can't say, oh, that's in the East, we won't do that, that's there, we won't do that. It would be very easy if it were uh, as lazy as that, but it's not. But that is actually the ethos we have as a firm. We will, work, we will work everywhere when needed, we will work nowhere. Uh, if needed, but it, but, it, it, but it is a real case-by-case -case, uh, assessment, and that's the only meaningful thing you can do. Because these empty apartment blocks that I show, they appear in Angola, they appear in Uzbekistan, they appear in the center of London, just the same. They appear uh, in, well, apparently in Warsaw. Uh, you know, so there is no black and white in the current world anymore, which, which means that they're only the most extreme diligence of looking at every, every effort individual gives you some hope of not ending on the wrong side of history. The, just a short number of questions. Because I loved very much the diagram uh, you showed about the Thomas Piketty and the uh, comparison to the period of manifestos. It was really brilliant. But uh, your answer was that uh, after the, the period of manifestos was over, like in 1989, something went terribly wrong. But isn't it the other way? Because before, before the period of manifestos, before 1914, the surplus of the of the outcome of, of the capital was much higher. Yeah, I know that. There's, there's of course that. So, so perhaps this, this, this period of, of uh, 78 years, it was the mistake. I mean, the yeah, whole modernist movement, that's the mistake. It was, was, well, was, was an anomaly. And, and the interesting thing of the Piketty book, uh, if you read it, is that he says that the fortunate situation that people could emancipate was intimately related to the misfortune the world suffered as a whole, that only under the pressure of wars and revolutions, etc., and a permanent overthrow and disruption of the mechanism uh, of capital did actually the other curve surface, and because of misfortune, there was a certain fortune for the working classes of people. And he says that the whole notion of struggle, of that type of struggle, is very central to the book. But I would say even that is besides the point, and he acknowledges that. But what he, what he tries to prove in his book, that if the economic system unfolds without misfortune and without disruption, it does not, and, and a lot of other economists always say, say that let capitalism do its work. Some people will be rich, but we will all be richer, etc. What he proves in his book that that is not the case, is that the natural tendency of that system is towards asymmetry. And uh, in a way the misfortunes in his, uh, even if it's in the form of revolution, wars, destruction and everything, 
those are small misfortunes compared to the real misfortune that an uncritical unfolding of the economic system has in the end uh, at large. And I think that is the weird paradox of his book. And of course, the, the, the graph of labor gets higher simply because the graph of capital massively drops uh, there. So you're right. I mean, they're both, uh, both readings are true. Do you want to ask another? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I have a question regarding your conclusion in the end, because I'm not sure if I understood whether you were um, saying that in the context of all the things happening, we should go temporarily and we should go. Um, with those easily demolished buildings, or should we, or was that just a wrong thing if you were proposing to go another way? Well, I. I... Ironic. Uh, you can never say something is irony because then it stops being irony. So, uh, the essence of irony is that it's in the eye of the. But anyway, the thing is that I like uh, to you know, following the book. And the book is a stage in, in, in anyone's thinking. And of course, life doesn't stop after the book, and particularly not your life as an architect stops after the book. However, after writing the book, I don't think it can be quite the same as before writing the book. So I do think it is interesting uh, to think about strategies of disrupting these trends, because I think these trends are bad, and I think, I mean, I see my children suffer from the same trend. They have a very different start at the beginning of their life than I did, and I'm not sure it's necessarily better. Uh, so I like to think of disruptive strategy. This was one. There might be many uh, others, and I'm sure this isn't the panacea to the whole problem. I'm under no uh, illusion. What I thought was very strange is that we did uh, a building in Rotterdam. It was finished in 2015. It was a new town hall, which was made of prefabricated uh, steel elements. It was like one or two details, and then blah, 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 could build the whole thing. It was a very nice building. It was quite cheap because it was built very fast. Uh, but it had an, had an immensely good Bream score. It had an immensely good Bream score because it was so easy to demolish, which I thought was, was very uh, weird. So that the, the, the penultimate criteria of sustainability was disappearance. Because, I mean, sustainability, you think, you know, it means lasting forever. You have all these kind of associations. And I thought that was an interesting paradox. Because, I mean, you demolished it, and then when you demolished it, you had no waste. You essentially had the spare parts, and you could apply them in a building uh, elsewhere. And that, that massively, for some reason, you have all these 70 criteria, and it massively upped the score uh, to the point that I think we even ended up in a category where we didn't realize who he would be. So, in a way, that triggered part of this, uh, part of this thinking. But there might be other directions. I mean, the, it, I just think it's an interesting, you know, beyond uh, a violent revolution uh, against uh, a particular class, what kind of disruptive professional techniques there are in the short term to, you know, maybe adjust the system or even have slightly less of the the bad trends. That's so. This is one. Uh, so I wanted to say something about housing, and I wanted to relate to the thing you said in the interview. I read recently because I read that um, we used to, uh, buildings used to be built cheap to have affordable houses for people, and now they're built cheap and sell them for. So an enormous amount of money. So it's not it's not anymore providing living space, but more um, rate investment rate. And I was thinking a lot about it because you know, I think a lot of us struggle now with that. That the flats are extremely expensive for us, and at the same time we have like a lot of empty space. And my bigger question is, who can have the power to reverse that? Space? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's a bit of a Pandora's box. Because, by the way, I don't think that everything started with the fall of the Berlin uh, Wall. I mean, I think a lot of this started in the, in the West earlier. It started uh, in the 80s, 
leading up to the fall of the Berlin Wall, when conservative policies in Britain and America and later also in, in Western Europe, uh, had a, they discovered essentially housing as an asset, uh, big time, which meant that, for instance, in the Netherlands, we go from a situation of 70% of the people renting their homes to 70% of the people owning their homes. Once people own their homes, the monthly uh, payment they do goes into building up their possession. Uh, they have a vested interest in the fact that the value of their home increases. So by making people homeowners, you also make them conservatives, almost by definition. You make them financial conservatives. And it was a brilliant coup, uh, a very dark coup of, of the conservative forces to make the vast majority of what previously were probably socialist voters for low rents, etc., by having them own their homes overnight, they became a conservative majority. Then that happened. They did very well. I mean, a lot of the people who owned a home saw their home make more money than they did by uh, working. So that first generation benefited. But then the trend continued. And then you have a next generation, and a next generation, and a next generation. And while the first generation initially benefits from that gap, the next generation finds can never be equal. They find a price is so high that they're beyond their reach. And uh, it's a kind of a system. Once you privatize something as, uh, as a government, you can't nationalize it. I mean, you can nationalize it by force. Uh, almost, but, but through no evolutionary course can you undo what you uh, did. So I think, this, and I think this will be a real, real, real problem. I think in 10 years' time, uh, probably in, 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 in Amsterdam and other cities in the west of the Netherlands, everybody will be renting again. But people will not be renting a house from the state. People will be renting a massively expensive bulk of homes uh, owned by real estate agents, foreign investors, etc., etc. I mean, uh, there will be a situation that massive amount of, of normal Dutch people will be paying rent to the Emir of Qatar. That is, and how to undo that, God knows. I mean, probably the only way to undo that is uh, to remove buildings from that economic logic. There is, an interest, there is an interesting initiative in Germany uh, at the moment, and an ever stronger movement who uh, simply wants to nationalize land under a law so that you can't speculate with land, because land value underlies property speculation. And once you, you know, you can't privatize air, and similarly say they shouldn't be able to privatize land. Once that happens, there might be a trigger to the fact that then you can't do that same thing to the system anymore, and that might be a turning point. But I don't know, but I think the, the answer as a whole is probably not uh, in, in my reversal of the term real estate uh, per se as a whole. I think it's probably uh, a complex of, of measures in a number of different domains, political, economic, uh, and, 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 and from the point of view of construction. Anybody's position on anything is, at least in part, always, of course, influenced by a personal history, uh, as is mine. Um, I don't know. In many ways, it's 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 too early uh, to tell. Uh, I know that it's 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 very strange that uh, I was born into a generation where uh, I could go to college because there was a system of scholarships which allowed anybody who had decent grades in, in the public high schools to go to university. 
That's where I could study, that's where I could get a degree, that's where I could get an architect's license, that's how I could get a job. Uh, at the same time in the 80s, also my parents, from being 70%, one of the 70% of the renters, went to 70% of the homeowners. So it's, it's, it's a kind of particular, uh, riding the wave of a particular course of history, where things were up in, in many ways, that has uh, allowed me to be something that, for instance, in the 19th century, would not have been possible. Um, whether this will continue in the same vein, I don't know. I mean, I teach in American universities. Uh, and it's very strange, people have there have to take out a massive loan to study, which is something totally unfamiliar to me. I could waste time in university, flunk, and had I flunked, well, I would have flunked, but I would have not had a massive debt. Today, people uh, between the age of 18 and, and, and 23 are faced with debts which are, by the time they come out of university, they, unless their parents are rich, they have astronomical debts. So already, who can study without concerns and who studies with concerns? Because, I mean, when we studied, we were all without concerns. Because, I mean, either your daddy paid, and if your daddy didn't pay, the state paid, but essentially you were equal. You were equal until you got a job and, and you know, a person became more successful than the next professionally. But until the age of 25, 26, you, know, you can see that that divide now starts at a far early, so private schools, starts at university. And there is a real, I mean, I notice I teach at schools and there is a real effect when students have in the back of their head a massive loan to repay the whole open-mindedness uh, that they have to learning is vastly different. What they ask me all the time is, sir, will this help me get a job? And I say, well, <laughs> probably not, unless you apply to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question I never asked. And, and, and I think learning stuff has to happen in a certain circumstance of gratuitousness, where there can be free thinking, where there can be critical thinking, because the economic system is already very prevalent from day one. I mean, the homeowners are conservative because they have a house to pay off. The students are conservative because they have a student loan to, to, to pay off. So there is a definitive effect on, not on raving poverty among white people just yet, but there is already a palpable effect on a climate of intellectual freedom and criticality. I notice that on, on almost every experience I have. And it's, I find that actually probably one of the most worrying things. part of the lecture without the, with the movable buildings was actually initially developed for a climate conference in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. We have 70% uh, of our country is below sea level and while most disasters in the world are very far away from the Netherlands, uh, this uh, climate change is one that will affect the Netherlands as one of the first yeah. in the sense that 70% of our economy is generated on territory below 
uh, the water level. So we would have to move and probably retreat behind the German border uh, if, if, we, if we are to survive. So some of the movable buildings was, was generated for that talk. But there is a there is a relation between the ephemerality of architecture and sustainability. I think that's good because it goes against the prevailing prejudice that architecture should be forever and when it lasts forever is sustainable. That's not necessarily true. That's the first thing. The book as a whole is a very is simply a call for architects to look beyond the walls of architecture. Look at the world at large. Look at how marginal your role can sometimes be and take yourself a little less seriously. And I think the notion of a temporary building probably also contributes to the notion of taking one a little less heavy-handedly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you. And I have to, uh, just a uh, final announcement. Well, there is a last event of the cycle uh, which will take part on Tuesday at 6 p.m. at the Goethe Institute again. It's Dorota Yenro, who is going to speak about EVA uh, and the uh, exhibition and, and built uh, prefabricated housing, housing in Berlin and how it was uh, visited and received by, by the architects from the other side of the Iron Curtain, as far as I know. So if you're warmly invited. And also there is an event organized by our uh, organization tomorrow uh, at the uh, uh, Museum History, Krakow History Museum, Sala uh, Jama. It's close to the Szczepańska uh, Street. And, and now we are going to, tomorrow we are going to talk about texts of modernism. We as an institute prepare an anthology of the text of crit critical and theories uh, from the uh, so we started in 1881. So, so, and we will have a great, I hope, interesting discussion. And finally, Sarah Kedja, and Jean-Claude Gantel, and Camilla Tvartoska, and Dr. Yenopoulos, also being the host and leader of the discussion. And no one's thanks to you,